Okay, so this is part three of week six. And what part three does is it talks about this, um, sort of how we started. We actually started the classification stuff last week and talked about the confusion matrix and misclassifying things and false positives and false negatives and evaluating a model. Um, we did the logistic model and there was like one misclassification. So this, what I'm covering right now is actually very important. Um, it's how to evaluate how good your model is. So you can make a model, but if you're, when you're doing classification prediction, your goal is to make a model that's classifying things, but you want it to be good. You want it to be classifying things in a way that's accurate and not misclassifying things because making a haphazard model that just misclassifies things doesn't really serve a purpose. Um, so this section here is about looking specifically at how to look at the performance of classification. Now, when you do this, it doesn't matter what method you're using. You can do this. You split data into train and test. You can do this for decision trees. You can do this for logistic. You can do this for KNN. So um, evaluating model performance is something that's common to all classification methods. Right? Um, yeah. So again, how to develop a classification model in general. Um, there may be multiple options. So there's like... And, and you might want to do multiple models. You, if you have a binary outcome, you might want to do a logistic, and you might also want to do um, a decision tree for the same data and see like what type of classification model is the best to use. So there's a little bit of, you know, don't get yourself like married to like one particular model type. Like explore and go around and do different ones. Um, and then when you um, have multiple models, you can look at the you can look at the metrics of accuracy for for and figure out what the best model is, which is a good thing to do. Okay, so you're looking for the best predictive ability. That's what's desired. You're looking for the model with the least number of misclassifications, basically, or the least percentage, because it's not about the number; it's about the percentage that are misclassified. Um, it's not difficult at all to experiment with different models and evaluate their performance. Okay, so. When you develop a classification model, once again, you typically use most of the data for training. Um, about 10% you want to do as a test. Now, when you have a super small data set, um, like the one I did in 101, if you took my 101 or something, there's only like 10 values. So then you want to go like five and five. But if you have like a thousand values, um, use 900 of them to make the training model and then use 100 of them, 10% to test it. Okay. The assignment of tests and training should be random. Again, I went over the example with, um, hi Taylor. <laughs> when we did the, we did this iris thing and the data was like totally sorted, we couldn't split it into random samples because one sample would have all of one type and it just didn't work. And so you need to randomize things. I was actually surprised in R, um, it's very difficult in R to take data that's sorted and then get random samples out of it. There must be a better way, but I had a difficult time and couldn't do it. Um, so. Yeah, I can do it in Excel, with, with, but I can't do it in R, which is really weird. But anyways, um, the data should not be sorted. In particular, the data should not, well, the data should be sorted at all. Um, so even though sorting data is like a wonderful thing to do, do not use data that is sorted based on your label when you do training and testing. You have to randomly select it. And if you just select like the first 20 observations from sorted data, you're going to like have a complete mess on your hands because you're not going to have a random sample from the data. So you want to, if you, if you go in Excel, what you can do is if you have, if you have your data in Excel, you can do a column and then Excel, you can use, um, I think it's just function ran to just generate a random number and then sort them based on the random number, which is okay because when you sort based on a random number, you've randomized, but you do not want to, you want to make sure that your training data and your test data are random samples um, and not, something that's sorted and then you'll have like all one group in the training and all one group in the test, which is just don't do that. Um, and then this is actually the same table we looked at before, which is that um, your model does your predicting, but your data has your actual, this will be in the test data that you'll be running this on. Um, and so you compare the predicted versus the actual in the test data and predicted A, actual A is great. Predicted B, actual B is great. But predicted A, actual B is not great, and predicted B, actual A is not great. So you have two areas in this classification and two areas not. So this would be, there's 100 total. So 15 out of 100, this would be like a 15% misclassification rate, which isn't terrific, but that's not terrible. I mean, you can only get, 
in the wonderful ideal world, you get like a 0% misclassification rate, but that only happens if you basically fake your data. Um, you are highly unlikely to get like zero and zero here. So you are gonna have misclassifications and you just try to minimize those. That's why you look at different models and see which model has the lowest percent of misclassifications basically. Um, so the ideal model would be a model that has um, no misclassification, op, but that just isn't going to occur, except it did occur in my example in 101, but um, that was a small data set. But in general, it's not going to occur that you have a perfect prediction model, which also brings us to the issue of, yes, um, when you make a mathematical model predicting, for example, who's likely to default on their credit for a mortgage, you're going to mess it up. I mean, there's, there's going to be people that get turned down for a mortgage based on the model that probably shouldn't have been, but that's just how it is. Um, anyways, this is different, by the way, from bias. Bias is if your data is not random. This is just because of the nature of variability in data, um, and you can't do anything about it. So the official title for this type of ta table is a confusion matrix. I do not know where that terminology exactly came from, because really, it's just a table. Um, there are several ways, believe it or not, even this little table with just these four numbers in it, there's actually a whole bunch of metrics that you can get out of this. Um, I wrote a research paper a while back, like 15 years ago. God, it was a long time ago. No, maybe it was more like 10 years ago. Um, I was comparing this Geisinger health data and I was comparing um, like lab tests versus like diagnostics. And I did like a whole bunch of metrics just like this. Um, but anyways, so, for the purpose of this table, it's binary. However, you should note that, I mean, binary means A, B, A, B. You can actually do these on um, multiple categories and you can get these to be actually pretty big. Um, and when you guys did the 101, um, I think it was Max, I forgot his last name, he actually did one of these with like a whole bunch of categories in it. <laughs> and I, kind of told him it was confusing, but then I gave him full credit anyways. But anyways, um, so you can expand these to an infinite number of categories. And again, you have the diagonals here. This is correct, correct, correct. But then you'd have just more misclassifications. So this becomes harder to do like a bunch of other calculations, but you can certainly do like correct ones and then incorrect percentage. Okay. So this is also something that we started with in the last week's lecture when we talked about the general things here which is that in general you have predicted class um this you can think of this as positive negative like the drug test example so this is a true positive when you predict something um that should be positive I mean, when you, yeah, when you predict something positive that should be negative, that's called a false positive. When you predict something negative that should be positive, that's called a false negative. Um, the other two are true negatives and true positives. The true positive rate, these are the sort of gritty little metrics. Honestly, you probably won't use a true positive rate that much, but a true positive rate is um, TP plus FN as a denominator and then TP is the numerator. So true positive rate is of the positive ones, which is class A, because I'm calling that positive, what percentage of these are correctly identified? Likely the true negative rate is the, the number of negatives, which I'm calling class B here. It's the percentage of these that are correct. Okay. You can also do a false negative rate and a false positive rate. These are your error rates. So the false negative rate is among the, 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 the top row, the positives, and the false, no, sorry, the false negative rate is among the bottoms. I did these sort of backwards. And the false positive rate is the true positive, or the false positives over these guys. So this is the false positive rate. No, I actually did that right. The false negative rate is of those that should test positive, how many tested negative when they shouldn't have. So the false negatives test negative when they should test positive. The false positive test positive when they should test negative. Anyway, so you can do all of these little individual calculations and they are separate calculations. Like these two are actually complement. True positive is a complement of false negative, but you can calculate all of these percentages. 
Overall, though, this is the one that in general you'd want to do, and that's just basically accuracy. And accuracy is the true positive plus the true negative over the total. So this is like if you do one metric, just do accuracy. Um, false positives and false negatives are more important for like drug tests, not necessarily for classification. Um, unless for some reason you actually um, care about like this particular metric as opposed to just the overall accuracy. Um, there's actually, believe it or not, a whole bunch more metrics to do on these, but we're not going to look at those. Okay. Then there's this thing called a rock curve, which honestly, I didn't understand these things for like 10 million years. A rock curve is essentially a visualization of how accurate a model is. And they look like this. Um, and literally, this right here is just the 50-50 line. And so this is the false positive rate. Okay. And... A rock curve is on the y-axis is a true positive rate and the x-axis is a false positive rate. And it's really not about like the specifics of this, but what it's about is like how far the line is from here. And you're like, what? Um, good classification will have a low false positive rate and a high true positive rate. So the closer the curve follows the left border, the better it is essentially. So this one, what that means is that this blue curve here like the closer it is to sort of just following along the border here, the better a model you have. And that's really all you're looking at with these rock curves. Um, so if you're like, if your blue line were like flat against the 50, 50 line, then basically your model is like no better than like random chance. So this is like a halfway decent model and you're looking for like this curve here. This is plotting the Y axis is the true positive rate and the x-axis is the false positive rate. So the closer this comes to the left border, which is along here, and like the curve would kind of go like this if it were like really, really good. And then like as you kind of get like a, a worse model, like so this is like a halfway decent model, but not a great model that we're looking at. Um, so there's a rock curve with what would be called an AUC, which is an area under the curve. Um, the whole area under the curve, this is a square. So if you had a perfect model, it would go up here and up here and have an area under the curve of one. So this has an area under the curve of 0.8. So it's halfway decent. So that's what these rock curves do. Essentially they're visualizations of how good your model are. Um, I found them confusing for years until I just kind of like finally got it. Um, but that's what that means. And then AUC, when you see, a lot of times you'll see AUC and not this actual plot. AUC refers to area under the curve for this plot. And the closer the AUC is to 1, the better the model. So this is 0.8. It's halfway decent. Um, yeah. Okay. <coughs> so these are different ways of assessing. Um, when you assess your models, you'll want to give the confusion matrix with the accuracy. That's the most typical one. Um, the AUC is the area under the curve from this, and it literally, the better it is to one, the better the model. And then, so what we've talked about so far, we train and test and we do one split. But um, the simplest way to test a classification method is divide the data into training and test, okay, which is what we've done so far. But you can do multiple splits. So you can do what's called K-fold cross-validation. And essentially, instead of splitting it into training and testing, now you have to have a fairly big data set to do this. You have, to, if you only have like less than 100 values, or even probably less than like 500 values, you really should just do train and test. Um, but if you have like a large data set, then you can do what's called k-fold. And instead of splitting your data in, in train and test, you split your data into 10 parts that for some reason are called folds. I'm not quite sure entirely why. Um, and then for each iteration, so you split it into 10 and then you run the thing 10 times and each time nine of the folds are considered training and then one of them is considered a test. And then your accuracy metrics are based on the average of these 10 runs. Okay. So this is my, I did this myself. This is my visualization of this. So the, the one to 10 here represent um, the 10 splits of the data or the 10 runs rather. And then A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. Um, these are 10 little bins. So the first run of this model, you'd use A as your test data and all the others as training data. The second run, you use B. So every one of the 10 gets run as a, 
a test. And then when you calculate your metrics, like each one of these, each individual one, each individual row is effectively going back to just doing this, but we're just doing it 10 times and we're using, we're splitting the data up into 10 bins before we do this. And then the results are essentially tallied for all of these runs. And then it gives you just a much better like um, accuracy picture. So you can do this and with computers, they just do this for you basically. You basically just tell the computer to run this. So the results of this are aggregated and then used um, to to be average, and so this kind of presents a um, it's basically a repeated sampling method, okay, and it gives sort of better estimates of classification accuracy, and it thus it would avoid the issue, um, it would avoid the issue of if by chance you had just one training testing split and it was like not, I mean it wouldn't be great still if that wasn't completely random, but using the k-fold would kind of like at least help with that. Um, it would help with sort of evening out any issues where your training data was, was not random. Um, and it would provide a much better estimate of accuracy. So that's all it does. Um, and it's called k-fold. I don't know exactly. I guess fold was just a good word to use. I don't know. Um, so you, 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 so you split the data into parts A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. That's 10, right? 1, 2, 3, 4. Yeah. Um, and then for each, you run it 10 times, and then for each run, one of them becomes a test data, and the others are the training data. So okay. that's how that works. It's kind of a neat thing to do. And that is it for the theory. Um, and then, of course, there'll be lots of exercises doing this. Okay, so that is the end of week six.